Next up, we're going to have Ian Ward, who's an independent developer and wrote the Irwid library, talking about cool stuff that you can do at Irwid. Hey, thank you. I'm going to repeat part of that for the camera. My name is Ian Ward, and I'm an independent developer. If uh, you've got interesting projects, uh, <laughs> get a hold of me. Okay, today uh, I've got a fairly light presentation. I'm going to be presenting a number of applications that use the uh, Irwid uh, console user interface library for Python. First up is bPython. And uh, now technically, uh, bPython is not an Irwid application. If you run it the normal way, it will just use the curses module. Uh, however, there is a backend that was developed for Irwid. So I'll use this as an excuse to uh, include this in my presentation because it's such a great program. I just want to show it off. So bPython looks like a lot like the regular interpreter, except that you get syntax highlighting and suggestions for completion while you type. This works for keywords, for names, for module names. And if you want to use any of the suggestions, you can just press tab while you're typing, and the, the text that you select will automatically get replaced. It also brings up doc strings while you're typing. So when you enter a function or method or creating a new object, uh, you get the description of what it is you're about to call, including highlighting exactly which parameter it is you're entering at the time. It's got uh, smart indentation, which uh, you know, most of us are used to in our editors, which is a very handy feature. If you open a block, it will indent four spaces for you, and so on. When you hit enter on a line that's blank, it will automatically unindent. So this is, I mean, as I'm sure many of you are aware, a whole lot easier than the regular Python interpreter. The autocompletion works for all the names that are currently visible, so including this class that I just created. It can automatically suggest that one. And uh, errors are helpfully presented to you in bright red, just to let you know when you mess up, which is a lot for me. Um, but uh, so with the regular Python interpreter, if I was in this kind of a situation where I had hand rolled a little class or you know, something more than a few lines, uh, the only way that I've found to fix it would be to hit the up arrow a whole bunch of times and hit enter and then try to keep doing that just, just right. bPython has a much better option. You can just press Control R to go back in history and you just show up in the middle of your class, <laughs> type some new code, and the class is fixed. So this, this is something that's very nice. And it also works on variables. So if I've just lost this object, I mean, maybe, maybe I've spent a whole bunch of time creating this, this big query set or something, and I blew it away accidentally, I can just rewind back to the statement where I'd overwritten it, and there it is. So very nice, <laughs> very nice features for an interactive interpreter. Next up is uh, Videotop. Now, this is a very simple little program that does its job very, very well. It's for downloading YouTube videos, basically, or also uh, streaming them. Uh, the interface starts off very sparse, but it's got all the information that you need. Uh, you just press Control S, or sorry, you type, uh, you type colon S, and then enter what it is you're searching for. So if I search for some videos, this goes out and uses the GData API to pull down uh, all the, the matching videos based on the search terms. You can then use the cursor keys to select videos that you want, and enter starts downloading. Now, this is done in a sub-process, so I can then select another video and start downloading another video as well. And uh, this is really handy uh, because, of course, if, if anybody's done this, you know that um, Google limits the, down, the speed that you can download any individual video. So this is a great way to get a bunch of them if you're going offline for a while. You can also stream directly from here. You press another key, it'll open M player and stream uh, from this interface. And when you quit, or sorry, uh, after you've downloaded, you've got a separate window that shows you all the, all the downloads that it's aware of, and you can play them uh, from there. Um, but then when you quit, everything is saved, including, including all of the current download state. So you can immediately go back, search again, and uh, resume your download without any extra effort. Next is a lot, which is a, um, a, a mail user agent based on not much. Uh, some of you might be familiar with not much. It's a tag-based organization for your email. So instead of folders like you might use in, a, um, uh, in an IMAP client, uh, all of the, it's just tags that's on the email that determines what you're looking at. This is going to be familiar for anybody that uses Gmail and, and searching through your Gmail folders. So not much itself, as 
the name uh, suggests, is not much of an, a mail client. It's actually just a command line client. You put your searches in at the command line, get results, and, and repeat. So this is an interface that shows you all the results of a particular search. The default one shows you everything in the inbox that hasn't been deleted um, in a nice, easy to list format. And the way that you move around is uh, by entering new search terms. So it's not uh, folders. Again, you just specify what email you're interested in. If I select one of my threads here that has a few messages, the first thing that happens is that it expands all the message messages in that thread. And then I could use this to scroll up and down just with the page, up, uh, page down keys to see everything. Or I can press Shift-C to collapse everything into this handy little tree uh, and quickly jump to the particular message that I'm interested in. From this uh, screen, you can also do all the usual things you do expect. Uh, you can forward, you can reply, you can mark individual messages. Um, you can pipe your messages to, uh, to external programs or bounce them, so forwarding without all the extra headers, which seems to have been forgotten in uh, you know, recent email history. You can also select individual messages and expand them with Enter. So it's a really nice way to, uh, to browse a particularly long thread and get around all from the, uh, the command, or sorry, from the console. OK, Tursus is a Twitter client. And um, I, I might not do the best job of this, because I, I haven't figured out the Twitter yet. But um, I'll try to show it off. Tursus uh, starts off with, I mean, after you do all the, the usual authentication, you, pu you punch the key in, it steps you through that process, with a screen of all of the, I guess, the latest tweets that you have yet to read. You use the HK, HJKL keys, like you might be familiar with from uh, VI, uh, to, to move around through messages. And uh, you'll see they also make some clever use of Unicode. They, they've got a recycle symbol that appears on tweets that are retweets. And uh, they've got syntax highlighting for different people's names, um, hashtags, and URLs. Across the top, you'll see that there's also tabs in this interface. And um, the, the default tabs will have you know, mentions and uh, things that have been sent directly to you. Uh, you move back and forth between those with the H and L keys. But you can also display multiple tabs at the same time. And this will just display adjacent tabs on the same screen in columns. So you can have two or three, if you like, uh, particular views that you use a lot and have them on the screen and updating for you. So all of the, the standard commands are there, uh, the things that you, you know, if you're following uh, uh, users, retweeting, all the stuff that you would expect, except that, of course, being a console interface, it's all keyboard driven. So you're not reaching for buttons to click. Uh, so you can, if you learn it, you can get a lot faster with it. Searching is one way to open a new tab. Uh, so if I see what the latest action in the Ninja Turtle scene is, I can do that. That uh, shows up as a new tab up there, and I switch, and there it is. T is used to tweet, and uh, that interface comes with the standard uh, count of the characters that we entered so far. The next program here is, or actually set of packages, is called Hashwar. Uh, and uh, Hashwar is a, is a set of packages designed for manipulating uh, and viewing a number of binary formats. Uh, it supports, I believe, between 30 and 40 different formats, including a number of video formats, uh, a number of compression formats, and uh, uh, image formats. And uh, according to the developers, the uh, Irwood interface is the, the sexiest one available uh, if you're just browsing around. So uh, this is a, uh, what it looks like if I was to open uh, a JPEG. Uh, it, immediately, it starts with all of the byte offsets for each uh, chunk of data at the left in a, in a handy tree. Uh, you can go down and expand any particular piece of it that you want to dig into and see the values for. All of the numbers that are displayed uh, default to a human-friendly mode, like the 39.2 kilobytes at the top of the screen there. Uh, you can switch that off with the H key to get exact numbers. And uh, you can just keep digging in and digging in. And the nice thing about this set of libraries is that uh, they, they're lazy. So it'll only do the amount of work that it needs to actually get the, the information that, uh, that you want. Um, it doesn't have to parse the whole, the whole file, so it comes up right away. And you can keep digging in dig and digging in. You can see, I believe the smallest uh, format it supports is uh, fields down to an individual bit. Here we've got some fields that are four bits each. And so there's a, you know, a 0.4 distance into, the, into this, this file. 
So that's, uh, that's the Hashwar Erwood interface. Uh, the, the library itself, the uh, Hashwar parser and Hashwar metadata are used by uh, certain media libraries to, uh, to, or media management libraries to pull out metadata from media files without needing the particular, uh, particular libraries for parsing those that might be written in C and that you might not trust as much as, as a Python code that could fail in a safer way. Okay, this one is mine. Speedometer is a little application that I actually wrote uh, sort of to demo what the library could do. And uh, if this wasn't screenshots and it was running, uh, or actually here, it is running. There it is. Um, it, uh, it will you know, steadily march along and update uh, with the rate of data that's uh, going across any particular interfaces that you're interested in on your, on your machine, um, as well as uh, rate of data being received in a file. Uh, so you can, you can point it at a file download and you can see exactly how fast it's coming down. If you tell it how big the file is supposed to be, it'll also tell you when you, it would expect it to arrive and give you a progress bar. Uh, on the command line, you can customize exactly how many of these graphs appear, uh, how they're divided. I've got them uh, one on top of the other, but you can have columns of them as well. You can also specify the scale and, uh, you know, on, the, on the left hand side. So that's a, that's a recording of me testing my cable connection uh, with a speed test. Uh, the other, uh, one really nice feature of the Erwood library is that uh, when you're writing an application using it, uh, you almost never write any code that handles resizing. You're, you're working with widgets and containers and uh, decorations that all have an understanding of what they're supposed to do given the amount of size they have. So this program you know, will just continue on. Here, uh, you know, the, the data is, is being displayed. And if at the same time I'm dragging the window, it'll just keep on going. So there's a graph widget that just knows how to scale itself into whatever space is available, and nothing special has to be written on, uh, you know, from the uh, developer's point of view. The last one here uh, that I'm going to present, and also my favorite, is uh, PUDB, which I wish I had found a lot earlier. It uh, starts off with a very friendly welcome message and uh, tells you PUDB is a full-screen console-based visual debugger for Python. You can scroll down to see the latest changes. Uh, the first time that you run the program, it enters into the preferences window. Uh, you can set whether you'd like line numbers displayed. You can choose which of the shells you'd like to use, including uh, the uh, BPython, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, to keep in line with the rest of the programs I've presented, I'm going to switch to a dark background here. Not that I have a lot against the sort of you know, uh, turbo vision colors that it starts with, just you know, <laughs> nice to be consistent. And uh, it has all of the usual commands that you would expect from a debugger, step over, step into, breakpoints, uh, stack view, except that, of course, those things are in windows on the side of the screen that you can, you can manipulate or look, look through a lot more easily, I find, than just with this uh, basic PDB. Uh, so this is a little uh, um, basic test program that uh, is a failed version of a, of a sum function uh, that takes the last two elements in a list, adds them together, and keeps doing that until it, uh, until it gives, a, gives you a value. But of course, there's a bug in it. So I run it, the stack explodes. And there's a big trace back in this window. I can scroll down to see everything, uh, everything that the user would see. Uh, but better than that, PUDB puts me into this post-mortem mode. Um, I've still got all the information about the, the stack frame and everything that's going on. So I'm just going to switch over to the stack window here, uh, go down a few stack frames, and take a look at what's in this values variable at the current time. So that doesn't look quite right. I was trying to add 567. We've got a number in here that's far too large. So I'll just expand my view a little bit, have a look at uh, a line that I find suspicious. And uh, so I'll take a look at that line where I am actually adding things. If I press Q, this brings up a menu that gives me the option to restart the program without exiting, and uh, I'll move down to this line, and I'll set a temporary breakpoint by pressing T. Uh, this sets a breakpoint, continues execution, and then removes it as soon as it arrives there. So it's sort of like teleporting straight to that line. So I arrive there, and uh, sure enough, I take a look at my values, and it has the, exactly what I expect, the values as they were passed in. Then I switch back to my code, and I step once more. And this is another handy feature in PUDB. When you're about to return a value, it doesn't return immediately, uh, immediately. It gives you one last chance to see what the value is being returned to the function that called it, which is sometimes tricky to find when it's, uh, when it's a complicated call chain. 
Uh, so I'll have a look at this, and I see, sure enough, okay, the numbers, the last two numbers were added correctly, but I just forgot to take the six off the list. Okay. Now, most debugging situations aren't going to be two little functions and ten lines of code. You're going to have lots of modules to deal with. So PUDB handles this very well as well. The module selection interface here, you press M, and then you can just start typing, and it will auto-complete to all of the modules that it can see that you can currently import. Um, and then you can just select the one that you wanted to open up. Or if it doesn't know about something, you can force it to import from here. If I scroll down to the bottom, or scroll down a little bit, and uh, this time I'm going to set a real breakpoint just so you can see what uh, that interface looks like. I jump over to the breakpoint window and open it up. Um, you see you've got the option to enable or disable the individual breakpoint. You can also jump to a location of the breakpoint. So if you've got a really complicated problem, you can use these like save locations to jump back and forth between. Um, and you can enter uh, a Python expression to, uh, as a condition that will uh, determine whether or not it's actually going to stop this time. So the last uh, thing in PUDB here is that you can always drop into a, uh, an interactive interpreter. Um, and this, uh, this is really sort of the catch-all. Anything that's difficult to do by adding a watch variable or, um, or, or looking through the code, you've got free reign here. You've got all of the local variables in the current stack frame. You can print them, you can pass them to other things, and, uh, and do whatever, whatever else you need to do. Okay, that's, that's my presentation. That was Time for questions? The questions? Yeah. So, with all modern technology wise, why do you think people still use console applications? <laughs> <laughs> <It's very interesting>. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, you're almost guaranteed that, they're, that the person writing the program is similar minded to you, and me meaning that they like an interface that they can use the keyboard, and it's very likely that you're going to be able to get, you know, learn it and get fast at it. Uh, that might be part of it. Um, I started working on the library just because I found lots of interesting problems to solve in it. There were lots of very hard things that are generally most people wouldn't be interested in, but I just wanted to see if I could crack them. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I like, I like console applications that have good interfaces, that are responsive, that resize right away, and that you know, behave generally well. So I was trying to um, you know, encourage that. You know, and, I, and I use console user, or, or applications with that console all the time. I probably have more uh, you know, GNOME terminals or X terminal open than any other window at any given time. Oh, yeah, sorry, the, the, question, yeah, the, the question was, why do people still use these things in this day and age, since GUIs are so wonderful, approximately, right? <laughs> uh, I used to use dialog tool for Bash, mm -hmm. and uh, at one point I tried to rewrite all the code I wrote in dialog in Python, and uh, when I tried to use Rwind, uh, it's, it was quite a bit more complicated than dialog. Is there any library that uh, just uh, lets you create a couple of GUI windows and that's it? Right. Uh, so there is actually... Uh, there is actually a dialog example program that comes along. With, uh, with Erwood, I just can't remember if there's, yeah, so there, these are screenshots of the dialog example program. So you could just copy that code <laughs> if you wanted this sort of thing. Um, I, I admit I was shooting for something a lot uh, like lower level than dialog, and I think there are some libraries that do just this um, sort of thing a lot simpler. So um, uh, you can take a look. I think there's a link to one of them from the, from the Erwood website as well. Uh, but if you're doing this sort of thing, yes, I admit, this wasn't really the, the goal. I mean, I, I think I was trying to serve people that are coming up with sort of the next Vim and the next uh, you know, W3M and, and, and that sort of thing, more than, uh, more than the simple kind of dialogue interface, even though I admit a lot of people are looking for exactly this. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I don't think it was available a few years ago, but now I'm definitely going to check it out. Right? Sure, yeah. What's your development environment look like? Do you use a graphical IDE or? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the question is whether I, I use a graphical IDE and, and no, uh, no I don't. I, I, I use Vim, uh, I use lots of, lots of terminals. Um, so, so yes, I'm, I'm certainly biased that way. <laughs> okay, that's it.
Thank you,